Please bow in session. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the June meeting. Uh, we're going to open up with our some presentations of awards and recognitions, I guess, is the first thing on this agenda that we want to do, or am I looking at the wrong agenda? I believe they were looking at the wrong agenda. It would okay. be uh, our public hearing for our budget. Okay. With that said, let us go to our budget workshop, All right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, just a uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and Board, and I know we have one of our board members online. Good evening. So uh, I think our budget process was very successful this year, and then we're down to that final recommendation for approval. We posted for uh, the required days for statute, and uh, we did not get any uh, in input or any questions from the community, which I think was positive. And then, um, again, we talked a lot this last six months just about what our strategy was as staff, and uh, I'm happy to report I think we grounded in those strategic principles. So I think that's the product up with. So, I'm going to turn it over to, to our director, Oldra, to cover the financial and just an overview, and I believe then we'll have a recommendation. All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, yeah, as Chief said, you can go to the next slide. Um, just real quick, kind of highlight, um, you know, the budget that was tentatively adopted uh, last month. Uh, it's a proposed tax rate of 25949. Um, with a tax levy revenue of $18,170,000. Um, in addition, we're increasing our non-levy revenue by about $405,000. So uh, total revenue for next year, uh, $21,632,000. Um, the proposed budget uh, does have the 5.9% cost of living adjustment, uh, step increase for all eligible staff, Obviously, as, as we talked at length, uh, we addressed our increases in our uh, benefit costs. Uh, we were able to add in an additional rover position to reduce um, overtime. Um, and, and the big theme, and again, I, as I say it a, a lot, um, what we're all experiencing, we addressed some significant inflationary increases in, in our expenses within this budget. Um, again, continue to fund uh, training. Um, after uh, Director McNeil's recommendation um, during the last uh, budget presentation, we increased our capital reserve funding to $1,432,000 again to ensure sustainability of our long term capital plan. Um, and then we also based our funding on the ability to eliminate our end leave liability funding because that fund balance has grown to a, um, a reasonable balance uh, to maintain. Um, our end leave liabilities uh, for the foreseeable future. So, uh, Mr. Chair, um, you have before you the uh, proposed 2023 budget of $21,632,000 um, at a tax rate of $2.59. Um, so, I'll be happy to answer any questions the board may have before you open the public hearing. Do we have any questions for Gabe or the Chief? Do not. Other than an amazing job that you provided, there's no doubt about it. I'm not, it's not really a question, but it is, is in, in the same lines as what uh, Gene just mentioned, that we put a lot of time and effort into this. Uh, you have, and, and staff, as fire chief and, and finance has, has put a lot of effort into looking at those areas where we potentially could have reduced the budget when, in fact, as was suggested by this board and particular uh, Helen here to my left, that we need to maintain our budget in order to sustain, sustain our, our track of being sustainable years to come. So it was more prudent 
to to reinsert that. And so in doing so, it still puts us in a good place where we're at. And uh, as a result, with a lot of hard work from a lot of people over a long period of time, even this board held its a workshop just to delineate some of these things and ask questions up front and personal with the, with finance. And I think that's something that as a group we hadn't done before. So it just goes to show that it, you know we're, we're in tune with what's going on. We can see, you know, uh, can't take anything for granted. Every every penny has to be accounted for, and I believe this uh, this budget reflects that. So, do we have any other questions or statements for finance? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It's, it's definitely a team effort, and everybody has has had their input. And, and good point, Mr. Chair. The board was uh, the most involved in, in, in a while in, in going line by line. I thought that was a very beneficial meeting, and I, I hope we continue that going. Okay. We just need to put it up in that calendar of, of, uh, <laughs> yeah. of events. So, okay, super. So I have two things before me. One, I've got a, uh, a budget hearing that we will open up in just a moment. And I also have a resolution to read that I think will be a result of that budget hearing. So with that said, <clears throat> the budget hearing is for the purpose of the fiscal year 2023 budget. Uh, I would like to uh, make a few ground rules for this budget hearing. Um, any individuals making comment shall first give their names and address. This is required because it's an official record of the public hearing is uh, of a public hearing being made. It's not necessary to be a proponent or an opponent in order to speak. Any disrupting anyone disrupting the proceedings may be subject to removal from the meeting. These rules are intended to promote an orderly system of holding a public hearing to give every person an opportunity to be heard. And I also will add to this that uh, those who wish to speak uh, maintain a, a three minute uh, maximum time limit. Okay. Chief Trotwine, are there any speakers from the public? Uh, not in the room. I know we have a few people online. I'm not sure if any of them are. Like to make a comment. Okay, then I will ask for is there anybody out in this Zoom meeting uh, that would like to speak? There are no responses, so I'll take that as a no. <clears throat> so, with no one choosing to speak, uh, this hearing that was open just moments ago is now closed. And with that said, uh, I can now entertain a motion to approve the budget through the resolution 2022-01. And then uh, following, there will be a motion of that. And Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, is the motion go first or the resolution reading? And to approve the resolution. Okay. So with that said, then uh, I move that the Resolution 2022-01, approval of fiscal year 2023 budget, be approved. I have a second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Let the record show that four. Uh, Janet, are you on board? Janet also said aye. You said I okay, and that is five four. The motion to be approved, and is there any opposed? There is no opposed. The resolution 2022-01 for fiscal year 2023 budget is approved. With that, I would like to read the motion because it is one of these motions that does not come around but once a year, right? So bear with me while I read this. <clears throat> a formal resolution of the governing board of the Sedona Fire District to adopt the 2023 fiscal year budget of $21,632,381 to encumber sufficient funds to cover outstanding items, purchase orders, checks, etc., from the previous fiscal year, less any cash and liability reserves, and to encumber any carryover amount to offset taxes, less any reimbursements, stop loss payments, and any adjustments for uncollected out-of-district fire revenues incurred prior to June 30th, 2023. 
establishing the balance to be utilized as our fiscal year and reserve fund balance as per the Sedona Fire District Policy 2014-2 fund balance. Whereas Arizona Revised Statutes Title 48 requires the Sedona Fire District to prepare an annual budget that contains detailed estimate expenditures for each fiscal year and that clearly shows salaries payable to employees of the, dis of the district and whereas the budget summary has been posted in three public places and a complete copy of the budget published on the district's official website for 21 days before a public hearing and whereas a public hearing was held on the proposed 2023 fiscal year budget on June 21st, 2022 in compliance with state law and whereas the Sedona Fire District wishes to encumber any carryover amount to remain in the general fund as our fiscal year and reserve fund balance to be maintained to allow the Sedona Fire District to continue providing services to the community in case of economic downturns and or unexpected emergencies or requirements and to provide working capital in the first several months of the fiscal year until sufficient revenues are available to fund operations. Therefore, it is hereby resolved that the Sedona Fire District Governing Board adopt the 2023 fiscal year budget of $21,632,381 at a tax rate of $2.59, including the 2023 wage scale, and encumbers sufficient funds to cover outstanding items, purchase orders, and checks, any cash and liability reserves, any carryover amount to offset taxes, less any unreimbursed stop loss payments, and any adjustments for uncollected out of district fire revenues incurred prior to June 30th, 2023, to remain in the general fund as our fiscal year and end reserve fund balance. This resolution has been approved and adopted this 21st day of June, 2022. Signed by David Soto, board chairman and board clerk, Gene McCarthy. Thank you. Okay, we will sign that right now. With that said, I'd formally like to thank the fire chief, finance, and all administrative staff that have had a part in this. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues here up on the board for their input and oversight and to ensure that we are sound financially and sustainable for at least the next fiscal year. So uh, thank you very much. And with that said, we can move on to the next agenda item. Okay. All right, next item on the agenda, and I do apologize for having the wrong agenda. You have the right one up now. Regular business meeting or public forum. Don't have anybody in the audience willing to speak today or wanting to speak today? Okay. Yes, sir. Our consent agenda consists of the April 19th, 2022 special budget meeting minutes the May 17th, 2022 regular meeting minutes, the annual acceptance of pension funding policy and the annual acceptance of salary schedule. Do I have a second? Uh, uh, that's the motion to I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The consent agenda has been approved. Financial report and updates. Director of Finance, Gabe Boldra. All right, um, still here. <laughs> okay, you're done. Um, yes, good, up, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. You have the May financial report in the packet. Um, starting off, uh, tax levy revenue, uh, we brought in 986,000 uh, for the month of May. That's about 40,000 over uh, what we projected for the month. Uh, non levy revenues were at 419,000 which was 116,000 over what we had projected. Uh, a couple things driving that. Um, one, our, our ambulance revenue still continues to outperform budget, um, as well as our wildland billing. Uh, we billed out 152,000 last month, uh, which was 55,000 over what was budgeted, as well as uh, CRR uh, was over by 21,000 
um, had billed out 24,000 for uh, CRR revenue. It's probably actually a good point too for me to bring up that um, um, we will be bringing forward a revised fee schedule to the board, um, all specifically looking at our CRR fees cost structure. Um, and once uh, Chief Booth and, and myself and, and gets together and, and finalizes that, we'll work with the Chief and present a complete package to the board. Um, moving on to our expenditures for May. Um, happy to report when you look uh, across the major categories, um, you'll see we are under budget um, by all major categories. Um, total expenses for May were at 1267000 uh, we were under budget by 117,000. Um, I do want to point out, though, um, our we did have a some small overage under uh, training. And when you look at the actual detailed reports within your packet, um, and a lot of that was due to uh, swift water training um, that had been delayed uh, for actually years. Um, now uh, it's finally been scheduled and, and paying for that. So. Um, looking at year to date. Uh, our total revenue is sitting at 19 million, uh, 937,000. We are over budget by 816,000. Um, again, property tax collection, we're about within 60,000 of where we expected to be at this point. So on, on 16 million, 60,000, a, a reasonable variance. I don't anticipate we're gonna see any delinquencies like we saw you know, a year ago um, with some of the, that COVID stuff. Um, looking at non-levy revenue, though, that, that is really what's driving that overage of 816000 Um Again, uh, ambulance revenue is the primary driver there. We're at $2.49 in ambulance revenue, which is uh, $565,000 over uh, what we had budgeted. Um, wildland revenue makes up another big percentage of that, um, as well as CRR. Uh, moving to expenses. We're at 15 million, uh, 352,000 in, in total expenses through the month of May, uh, which is under budget by uh, 1.1 million. Um, again, looking across major categories, we are continuing to trend under budget on all major categories. Personnel is under budget by 873,000, mainly due to salary and benefit savings from vacancies, um, as well as to what, you know, again, just some turnover throughout the year that we've, we've experienced. Um, buildings and land is under budget by 75,000. Uh, vehicles and equipment is under budget by 34,000. Uh, communications and IT under budget by 112,000. And managerial um, under budget by 16,000. As far as our percentage expended, we've expended 90%, uh, with 10% uh, remaining for uh, the last month of the fiscal year. Uh, as far as a breakdown, personnel is our highest at 85%. Um, operations is at seven, and both communication and managerial expenses are at four percent. Finally, year over year, uh, we ended the month with 15.9 million total cash on hand, uh, compared to the 13.5 million last year. This same time, uh, so overall, our cash on hand increased by about 2.4 million. Um, you'll see other assets actually remain fairly stable, um, as well as total liabilities decreased by about. So unless there's any other questions, that concludes the report for me. I have a quick question. As, as far as our expenditures for this, this last month of the, this fiscal year, what do you anticipate the carryover into next year, next year's budget is going to be? Um, so right now, based on our current expenditures, we're looking at um, ending the year with about $13.5 million total cash on hand at the end of the year. Um, and so from a kind of a budget performance, right. um, what are we carrying over? That that equates to just under a million. So right around, you know, 900, 950,000. Okay. And that's, that seems to be enough carryover for that first month and a half, two months for until we start receiving funding from the county? Oh, yeah. That'll be, that'll be more than adequate. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and move to uh, accept the May 2022 uh, financial report. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, okay. Any further discussion on that? All in favor of uh, the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The May 2022 financial report is approved.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up on the agenda is the staff items, which would be the chief's monthly report. Chief Troutline. Thank you, Mr. Chair Board. Uh, looking at some of our summary data, you see that May was a very busy month. As we trend into the summer, June, July, August will be expected to be busy as well. And, and bringing a note to that bottom number there, the rescue. You see, our rescues continue to be steady, but especially this time of year, in spite of the heat, uh, we will have a lot of people out in the trails. Therefore, uh, unfortunately, we'll get some significant rescues out there. Um, and then, year to date totals pretty trending about last, like last year, you can see 53 calls different. And then, our station station response is trending about Normal. All right. Um, so, unless there's any questions on those two slides, I'm going to turn it over to Ed. Yes, sir. You know, I've got a quick question before we move on. Um, Chief, on the graph that you've shown, we used to look at a graph that, that uh, indicated response times, uh, and it's maybe got lost in the, the changeover. Uh, is that, can we get that one back? Or? Yep, and I, I know a uh, board member from Yellow had brought that up before, and we're working on getting that ESO changeover so we can get you more accurate data on that and get that back in front. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, administration, we'll turn it over to Director Robinson. Outline, Chair, members of the board, um, to answer the question, I think the removal of the slide that didn't have any data was intentful, so rather than including the slide, slide with no data, we'll wait until there's data on it to put it back in there for you. Uh, is that due to the new change over the program? So it's, it's, yeah, it's been ongoing where we haven't had that update for you, and the slide has been indicating that it'll be coming. And okay. so we're just going to we're going to surprise you when it's there. Thank you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, some of our news and highlights of events. You can see from the photos that we placed on here, uh, our Chief Troutwine getting hosed down over at Camp Courage. The Arizona Bird Foundation puts on a, a wonderful week-long camp in the, in the forest in Prescott. Um, several of our members actively participate in this annually, uh, Chief Bud Lukowski being one of them a major participant there. Uh, both of the both of our Fisher brothers were there this year as well. And then the one behind the hose is firefighter uh, Granada who's out on the pipeline fire right now. So um, you know, working hard, playing hard and, and participating. So we brought out some cornhole, played with the kids and had a great time representing Sedona Fire. Um, the Keep the Sedona Beautiful, have a meeting uh, for wildland fire question and answer period. Uh, Chief Booth and Chief Troutline attended that to answer some questions, uh, get them involved, happy to have their participation, and make sure that they understand the plan and where to get that information. Uh, since it is a group effort, it is not just Sedona Fire, it is not just the city, it's the county and the forest and, and many participants. So I think there's a better understanding. Uh, Mr. Soto, I believe you attended, and I don't have the exact title of that, uh, correct, I'm sure, the Yavapai County, uh, it was a cooperative meeting over, it was in Prescott, yes? Yes, and uh, I'll, I'll bring up what I did. I figured you would, so I wanted to highlight that, that we knew you participated in it. It was in conjunction, at least it seemed to partner up with that, that presentation that Chief Booth and Chief Troutwine did here locally and getting some more information and really just uh, emphasizing that cooperation between, um, between agencies. Um, the last piece that I have for news and updates of things that are ongoing is our ongoing website update. So we've been meeting regularly with our web designer um, to get a new, just kind of updated, cleaner, more navigable uh, website. We want to keep the amount, the large amount of information that we have on our website just making sure that it's accurate, that it's easier to read, easy to access, and it makes sense. So we've been actively working on that, doing some copy edits, giving some updated photos to the designer. And we have another update meeting on Thursday. 
we can kind of look at a shell and then start moving things around as we see what it looks like in a, in a demo environment. So we look forward to giving you some updates, but we need to have more information and something for you to see before we can show you. And I know it may be difficult, but as far as trying to project what's up and coming, is that more on the short term within the next month or two? Or are we looking at for the balance of the year? For or? timeline for the update, we'd say about six to eight weeks for completion. And timeline for events, is that going to be long term, short term? How do you guys see that? For scheduling events, um, if you could clarify, I'm not sure what you're Oh, okay. Anything that may be coming up uh, district within the district? Oh, you just mean for what I'm putting for in what here? You're doing here yeah. Absolutely. So it's as we understand and as we know events and getting um, things that we can tell you that we know are happening. So, um, yeah, it's, I would say it's fluid. Sometimes we'll be far reaching out if we know that there's something major that we're participating in and it's coming up. Like if we're trying to schedule a mental health con uh, uh, conference in the spring, if we're able to get that confirmed, uh, we'll announce it as soon as we have it. So we won't make it wait till it's just a month ahead. Gotcha. Um, okay. But if we have events, if we have uh, a lot of events, or if they're all te uh, tentative and we're not sure that they'll carry on, we might not place them here. A question: Some, there's several other large organizations that are wanting to rebuild their website for ease of use and whatever. How do you know when you that you actually have accomplished it since unless you bring in a third party that's never seen it before and say, uh, find something? Um, you know, uh, how does one know? Because it, it seems like we're so biased and then we tell ourselves this works great, only the stranger you can't find that document that you told them to go look Absolutely, for. and that's a really good question. And so that's part of the package um, and why you know, we're not trying to take it on ourselves and pretend that we're web designers. We have um, we contracted with a company that does this, and part of what they do is that research. So they look at um, the metrics and measurements of page hits, how many times they click through, how many people are going from uh, following a link from the, the main page to a drop down menu to the actual page to maybe a document that's within it. And if people are able to follow that navigation stream and they're watching how many times that happens, then it gives them an indication that their paths work and that the, uh, that the construction is correct, that the architecture of the site is leading people where we need them to go. So they have metrics built in that they look at from what they can discern from the existing site to what it looks like changing at 30, 60, 90 days post. And does each department have access to the website for updating their area? We will. Or is it we done? will. So at this time, no. And that's one of the things that we want to change is to make sure that we're not um, bottlenecking through IT where they have other things that need to be done. This isn't something that, that needs to be part of, um, of their, not to say their purview because obviously there's an IT component of it but it, it doesn't need to be under their management. We need their expertise in a different area. So our new, our old website is as well as built on a WordPress platform, which is just known for being user friendly. So it's something that's in real language. Um, you don't need to know code. You don't need to know programming. All of that's built in, in the construction. And then we'll be able to go in. So Stephanie Knight, our receptionist, will be able to go in and put announcements in there for closures or fire updates. Um, we can have live links in there that will update to fire weather. So when we've got stage two or three fire restrictions in place, we can update those very easily when there are events. So we don't have to wait to a board meeting to announce that we have events going out there. We'll be able to announce them and delete them as they come, making sure that our news is updated appropriately, that things of special interest are updated, and that every time we have people out on a fire and they capture some of those amazing photos that we put on Facebook, that we can also update those there and make sure that they're visible. So I assume that would mean out of district fires that are visible to the people uh, throughout the district, what have you, who are constantly worried about something is happening 75 miles north. Correct. So in, to, to Mr. McCarthy's point, we want to make sure that we've got um, at more information and easier to get to so that it makes sense. So we're looking at a call-out box that seasonally will explain fire weather. And so it'll let people know not only the conditions here, but we'll be able to update 
those kinds of things that will head off some of that information seeking. So making sure that they have the correct links to the correct agency that has the updates that we can then also let people know there's smoke in the area, what is it? So like a, a frequently asked question piece that we see, how, how far is 15 miles? And, and is that a, a danger? Because people don't conceptualize that and see that 15 miles is, it can be short or it can be really far. So we're um, wanting to make sure that we can highlight those components and in conjunction with our new phone system, the same thing, so that we can change those outgoing messages, um, have links to the direct hotline instead of folks wondering, trying to leave a message with Sedona Fire when we're closed for the weekend, um, that they can actually access those hotlines and, and have it be the right number. So all very good questions. All things that we want to integrate into um, the home page and, the, and the, it being navigable so people can find those things that are important to residents. Uh, if there are any other questions or comments on that part of it, I'll just continue on. So we have some staffing updates. We'll just give you our recruitment updates. Several positions um, remain open and in recruitment. Um, we do have our telecom positions open that we're doing. We have an offer out to our um, the user technician. We're waiting for a, uh, the clearance background check, that kind of thing. So we're looking forward to that higher beginning. We do have the radio tech technician still open, and our GIS uh, begins the first round interviews on Monday, so we're very excited about that. Firefighter, uh, the National Testing Network, that position closed, so applications for our position closed on Thursday. We have over 80 applicants to Sedona Fire through NTN, which is a really good finding. They're narrowing down. We're looking for the top candidates to move forward and then we'll invite them through the process. The assessment center for that is going to be in early August. Um, upcoming, some things that are coming up. Uh, we've been trying to put together our Stop the Bleed program for our administrative team. We have installed, I don't see that in the room, um, Stop the Bleed kits in our administration building on each floor um, that are those emergency kits for if you have an incident in your building and you're waiting for emergency response. Even though we're right here, we anticipate that if there was an issue in this building, we might not be able to be attended to right away. So um, Battalion Chief Baker has been working with his team to coordinate that training. We've invited the members of the board to come and join us. As far as I know, we have three members that will be participating in that training. So we will put out our public notice and make sure we don't talk any business. We're just going to talk, stop the bleed. Um, <laughs> we put on top of that, if you didn't get your invitation, please let me know and I'll make sure that I send out that calendar invite to anyone who isn't in that listing. Um, all are welcome. Thank you so much. After the conclusion of the Stop the Bleed program, which will be here in this room, we are going to add on to that our resilience training. So it is um, put on by engineer John Scaife. He does that every, with every new recruit. Um, and does it annually with our team um, operationally. And we've asked if admin can go through that as well. And so it's a really great program. He uh, presents it at the Fire Academy um, through ASU every year. And he is going to present that to us as well at the end of the Stop the Bleed. So we're very excited that he's able to do that for us. Um, functional movement screening, so as part of our employee wellness program, so the peer fitness and employee wellness um, is with our gym equipment, making sure that those things are updated, making sure we're getting our testing done annually, physicals and pre-cancer screening, those types of things. The functional movement screening is more of, um, is, is a body wellness, it's balance, it's flexibility and it's reach and it's those kinds of things anyone, fit or not fit might get injured doing stepping off stepping off an engine or stepping off a curb. And so um, all the gentlemen have gone through, so all of our firefighters have gone through the functional movement screening. They've just completed those and caught up on them uh, this past week, I believe. And then they'll be scheduling one for the admin team and anyone who missed it uh, coming up later in August. Uh, they wrapped us in before COVID and we all got our baselines, but we've had some turnover before then, so some new employees will be getting their baselines and their functional movement screening. <laughs> and Kimberly is all set. 
Um, if any of the board members would like to participate in that, we'd like to invite you to join us with that as well. A quick explanation. Functional movement screening means what? So functional movements are things like being able to step over an object in front of you or step onto a ladder or off of a curb. It's balance. It's being able to reach as you bend at the same time. It's uh, being able to get up and off of the floor in different kinds of positions and different stretches that would require balance, that would require not necessarily strength, but some amount of flexibility. Okay. And so if you're over 70, are you exempt? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the more important groups for us to screen in this manner because those kinds of, it's the injury. Who knows somebody who ended up in traction because they, they were reaching for a tissue and sneezed at the same time? You throw your back out from something like that, and it's due to a, 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 a sometimes comes from sedentary lifestyle, sometimes from pain, sometimes from overuse, or just from not stretching and paying attention to the way your body and your ligaments and your bones are supposed to work together to keep you balanced and healthy and fit. Not to so. be any levity, but it reminds me if I fall and I can't get up. It is exactly that situation, and so um, it's trying to help us all avoid that situation. And there's no like right or wrong, and each of these screenings will come with where you're deficient and how to improve that. So we're not just going to say, well, you certainly can't. Here's a great motion. So if you can do something like this, are you all able to reach behind your back and touch your fingers behind you? Give it a try. That's a functional movement screening motion that they test, <laughs> that tests your I failed. <laughs> motion in your shoulders and in your elbows. And that's going to show how you might be likely to injure yourself. So Firefighter Feeney of the MDA Bikeathon fame, he has taken over this part of the screening for us, and he is not just going to assess you, but then he's going to give you a handout that says these are the things you can do that will help you improve your range of motion and your flexibility here. So it will include a path to get you to be able to be more flexible in that motion. Yes? We don't just grade you and then send you on your way. We'll give you some homework to do. Good yeah. stuff. For those of us who served in older fire service in capacity and what have you, um, it was um, they placed you on a table and you had to touch your toes. Uh, how far you could stretch? We called it the rack. It was a medieval torture. We don't have a rack, but there's another one of that, and it's the same thing. You do have to actually bend down and see if you can touch your toes. So. You're not allowed to stretch and practice first. You ought to be cold. They're very, very cruel. So how do, when is that? It has not yet been scheduled. We need to get ourselves a little bit through firefighter season in the uh, wildland. We anticipate it being uh, active, and so um, scheduling is going to be a little bit challenging. We're thinking sometime in August. All right, but we'll keep the board in mind when they give us that date and invite you all to join us. Yes? Excellent. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, Moving on to the infamous awards celebration, we have finally distributed all the awards to all the recipients, so the chief is uh, very excited <coughs> about that. Um, again, we run into a very early start to a wildland season, and we expect it to be active, so we are anticipating that we want to look at a fall planning for, um, for the previous year's celebration, and then we'll kick it right off again and look for a spring uh, for the, the next year. With all conditions, participating with us, excited about it. Um, then we'll just get down to the end, and we're finally there, the mental health moment, um, telling you what our kind of our months are. And so uh, two things I think of note here is that June is traditionally called Pride Month. It's for um, acknowledging and, and supporting our LGBTQA plus uh, community members. And, uh, and I mention it as a mental health moment because there, it's, a, it's a population that's, that can be under a lot of stress, that there's um, more violence and there's more suicide uh, towards members of this community. So just the month of awareness showing that <coughs> first responders are handling those issues. They're, they're often first on scene um, for some of those issues of crimes against members of that community and, um, and, the, and the outcomes of depression, drug abuse or abuse, 
um, that uh, can come from that sort of feeling on the outside of a community. And then the one that's really very impactful to, uh, to us, to first responders, is that June 27th is National PTSD Awareness Day. Um, it's something that's prevalent in first responders, and it's not always one incident. Sometimes it's a, a compiling. It's, it's a, the continual issues that create a PTS or PTSD response. And we're trying to be aware of it. We're trying to encourage folks to acknowledge it and accept assistance for it. And we're working very, very hard with our mental health providers, with our insurance carriers, and our communities to try to provide support and resources to help um, people who cope with that recover and, and live with those outcomes. And so we're all doing that here in June, and I'll take your questions and comments. Are EAP recognized PTSD? Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Chief. Thank you, Heidi. And if you hold that slide for a minute, I will. in the uh, theme of functional movement, you'll see on that left hand picture, that is excellent technique when it comes to cornhole. There is no injury to that individual. I happen to know him very intimately. It's me. Now, I also want to bring on the right hand side. You can see it's unknown why one of our firefighters uh, turned to charge post on the fire chief. Just so you know, we do have human resource process to follow up with that kind of thing. I know a name was used earlier, but I want to say until the full investigation is complete, we really can't have a fit everyone. And just so you know on that, you can see that the fire chief is a full compliant position when someone comes up to you off the hose line. So um, that's part, of, you know, we want to look at that. Uh, he wasn't running. He wasn't uh, complaining. And just so you know, I did walk towards him, twirled, so it was very well distributed. But very refreshing. It was appreciated after the fact, but there's some startling moments I might have. <laughs> Thanks for pausing on that a minute. I felt like there were some gaps to fill in there. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so uh, we'll move to our operation uh, brief. And so also, just from administration, thanks. Uh, there's a lot going on in the Sedona Fire District, and uh, it's just not responding to 911 incidents. And I know we'll highlight some things here in our operations, but uh, Chief Coyle is still uh, deployed in New Mexico and uh, is going through DMOB with his team and, and he'll uh, be on the road, <clears throat> uh, I believe, either tomorrow or Thursday. Pretty much a two-day trip to get back out. Try not to put uh, our people on the road super long periods after being on a deployment for two weeks because there's fatigue factors. So he'll uh, do his two-day trip home and get some rest, but, uh, you know, New Mexico was hit extremely hard this season. They probably uh, they had a season that uh, is probably historic for them. And just so uh, one of the big factors, again, was that the wind. So these fires, of course, with the conditions we have in the southwest, with the fuel, weather, topography, really wind becomes an incredibly significant factor this time of year. And you notice around the Sedona area here in our district, we've experienced a lot more wind more than normal. Uh, and, and when it's that unpredictable wind that shifts often, those become very challenging. So we're hoping all our personnel that deployed out there in New Mexico will stay safe. Uh, we've had three or four overhead personnel that went out to respond uh, and assist with those fires. Uh, also, uh, when it comes to locally, we have the, the pipeline fire up in uh, Flagstaff. And uh, we have a Type 3 engine there with four of our personnel. And uh, it did an excellent job. Uh, we had some postings that actually was picked up by the governor who really liked our post with our Sedona Fire District and our Type 3 up there and the work that we're doing. And that got pushed all over the state. I think it had 100,000 likes or looks. I don't know, I'm not a social media guy, but whatever they were, 100,000 people took a look. And uh, again, it really elevates us across the state, but that pipeline incident was a significant incident. And again, wind was a big factor with that 
first couple days, that wind pushing down that fire, uh, and fortunately, it did push more to the east, which was away from a lot of the values uh, and, and the structures up there. So we we're fortunate the wind direction, although it's a good, again, current example of conditions are right. We're in the middle of our wildland fire season, and wind can become a factor where we we deploy, we get out of the way, and right when those winds die down is when the crews are able to pick that up. And uh, they held our type three up there to assist as they uh, mop up and uh, do some recovery efforts up there. And the temple because they really trust our troops and our training and our apparatus and equipment, and our our team is up there doing an outstanding job. Uh, so. What's our outlook? Uh, we're in the middle of it, again, where the conditions will shift for us here in Arizona is when those monsoons come. And it was nice to get a little bit of rain the other day, uh, but we're hoping mid-July we'll start to see some significant monsoon weather. Hoping then that brings that moisture and recovery that we need to get us through the rest of the summer, and then we'll be uh, doing a lot better here in Arizona. So let's keep focused on those stage two restrictions. I know booth will probably bring some of that up, but uh, that's important that we mind our situation awareness and keep those restrictions going. I need to give the update in terms of uh, GIS or recruitment. This week uh, we will go do some final panels and get down to that person, uh, and then hopefully we'll get a really good GIS person and we can keep that, that uh, system and division going. Any questions under operations? Just um, when we deploy, like up on the uh, pipeline fire, as far as um, picking up the hose, recovering the hose, usually uh, after these fires, it's a it's a major a major job, sorting and recovering. How do, how do we do on that? Well, that is a good question, and when you're in the real dynamic component of a deployment on a fire like that, uh, we don't worry too much about where some of that ends. In other words, sometimes we have to lay hose and we have to attack the fire and be aggressive, then we have to move very quickly to another area of that fire. So it's not uncommon that we would leave hose lines stretched out and in the street or up on the hill. Um, at some point, if we're, our crew isn't able to go back and recover that, uh, or it gets burned over and damaged. That's something once our, our fire and our incident management team gets set out of the logistics section, and you fill out a form and you say, hey, we lost 100 feet of hose, inch and a half, up on the hill, and you put all that specific stuff and then they replace that. The idea is when we deploy, we go with a, a rig that's fully outfitted with apparatus, equipment, hose, and anything that's damaged or lost or has to be left on fire we recover that and or get it replaced so that the rig comes back intact. That's a typical process. Good question. Just a comment. Uh, Mayor saw Chief Coyle on a uh, regional TV, or not local, something coming out of Phoenix. Uh, there was, there he was on. Yeah, I, under, I understand they had a, uh, it was a kind of a thank you benefit, uh, easy talk was there doing a concert. They brought uh, certain people from uh, Chief Coyle's team up there. He was one of them that got to make some comments. Uh, uh, the whole crowd, the whole community was very thankful to their team and the work they did in the fire part. So he had the privilege not to perform musically with them, which I would have enjoyed, but uh, to get up on stage and their team and those fire fires deployed were recognized and that they did make some pretty high level news like the uh, yeah, and it just highlighted what a great job everyone's done, really. We're very proud of them. Thank you, Chief. All right, thank you. So we'll go to uh, Community Risk Reduction Division Chief Booth. Thank you, Chief. Um, so thankfully I got the slide in. I was out on assignment when most of this was due. I was over on the south side of Chief Coyle at the Calf Canyon Fire for the last couple of weeks. Numbers, um, as Gabe kind of alluded to, with the revenue coming in from CRR, we are seeing continued increases of plan reviews and inspections. Um, code consultations, we have a lot of large scale projects, whether they're new builds or 
apartment buildings or hotels and um, and a gas station right across the street here because I'm starting a lot of pre-construction meetings as well as um, preliminary code reviews and site visits to help figure out you know, where they do fall within the wildland urban interface and how they can be part of the sustainability of our community as well as being resilient. Um, Firewise consultations were, were down a little bit, but I think a lot of them are also getting mixed into the new construction side of things and not just isolated into Firewise specific. Had a couple opportunities through the equine evacuation emergency drills, as well as the state fire marshal's office has come up um, with some firewise information. So I look forward to continuing to grow that. It's probably going to be a little bit slow during fire season. Um, a lot of the, the key players have been assigned out to other fires. Um, new fire prevention officer for the National Forest Service for our area, but not only Cass Canyon Fire with me. Um, our law enforcement officers were up at pipelines, so we're kind of all over the place right now with um, getting through wildland season. New company inspections, we um, do have a couple of light duty firefighters that are going to be off due to injuries for a little while, so they're going to be tackling those uh, company level inspections for us and getting out and getting updated. So those numbers are going to continue to grow. Um, while the firefighters are recovering, so it fits within their limitations and abilities to, to do that, also fits the mountain mountain community and still involved and engaged with the, the organization. The compliance engine, we've talked about that a little bit. The numbers continue to grow as we're doing inspections and see new buildings and new installations. So um, we're doing pretty well with maintaining compliance systems across the district. Um, these are commercial occupancies only, not residential. They're deficient ones. They're usually small things like missing sprinkler plates or um, nothing major. We don't have any impairments, so these are just minor things that don't necessarily affect the full functionality, but it is a deficiency based on the standard. Two fire investigations that's shown here. One of them shown in the picture here. This was a van that's associated with higher um, operation. They purchased an outfit out of Spain, which is a lithium ion battery. Pack um, to run the fan that you see there, um, resulting in a thermal runaway of those battery packs and ultimately approaching the van. Um, they were able to get that stopped before it turned into a wildland fire. So that would be our safety message too, is talking a little bit about lithium ion batteries. A little notable event, uh, Inspector Riddell was able to go out to the National Fire Academy to complete the commercial fire sprinkler plans examiner certification. So um, we're continuing to build our depth and knowledge and skill set in our group. Spring was fried after a week of crunching numbers and hydraulics and looking at plants, but it's better because of it. He just didn't realize that. <laughs> um, so let's go to our safety message. Lithium ion batteries. Everybody, they're so common knowledge today and common that most people don't realize they're carrying them with you everywhere you go in your pocket. Our cell phones are lithium ion batteries, your computers. Um, gadgets that you have because the longevity of those batteries and quite frankly they're very good. Um, we're starting to see them in the residential um, battery storage systems at home that Tesla and some of the other big things are putting in. And they're great so long as they stay intact and they're used within their limitations and listing. So um, some of the big problems that we have is these small batteries carry a lot of energy um, and they stay there. So if you look if you look at the picture on the bottom right, those cylinders, if you will. Those are the lithium ion battery components. Regardless of how big the battery is, they're always going to be full of those size lithium ion components that are about the size of your pinky. Um, and they just bundle them together. They become projectiles on fire. They also create a lot of thermal runaway, which creates a lot of heat. So we're seeing that in the electric vehicle industry as well as the charging stations. Um, so using both those charging cameras and things of that nature, some of the recommendations, you know, don't leave them unattended. Um, don't sleep with your phone under your pillow or your bed, if it, even if it's not plugged in, because they can get overheated. They live in the desert. A lot of these lithium ion batteries are tested in the, on the East Coast in controlled environments, not necessarily in 120 to 140 degree weather if they're left in your car or isolated. So they need air to breathe to remain cool. Don't throw them away. I know that a lot of places, um, 
Office Depot. They've got a battery recycling feature with the vinyl batteries there. Don't keep them plugged in for a long period of time. Plug them once your device is charged. They are, if you can smell them, if they're hot to the touch, they change the warping. Um, remove those, set them outside, you know, and get them cooled off and have, get them properly disposed of. Keep an eye out for those, especially in the summer months. Don't keep your batteries as long as you have to use your car because it can cause them to fail. Questions. Just a comment. Um, uh, just a couple of days ago, I was going through the internet again and uh, came across a rekindle lithium battery in a vehicle three weeks after it was taken to the to the uh, wrecking yard. So the department was called out, and it wasn't the department's fault. It was the nature of the lithium. Which is a combustible metal battery, and I things t I go back to the years ago when we were fighting fancy wheels on trucks and automobiles, what have you, made of magnesium and so on, and other materials and so on. So, yeah, th uh, these are <laughs> these are these are problem. Well, I'm curious when there's a ca electric cars, you know, like a Tesla, when they have a wreck. And all those batteries, what do fire? What do what do you encounter? It depends on the battery or the, the vehicle type and the location of the battery. Um, one of the things that Tesla has actually done is they've put out first responder training um, that comes around every about once a quarter to different areas. Um, ACS as well. They're doing a lot of battery industry where Gene's right. Um, one of the recommendations for when you do have a vehicle that's encountered in an accident is that vehicle gets towed by itself and put usually with about a 100 to 200 foot perimeter away from everything else unless it sits for 30 to 45 days until it, it does its thing. Um, a couple of years ago down the Prize and McKinnon energy fire, the explosion that injured multiple firefighters from um, Peoria, Arizona was surprised. Those lithium ion batteries actually stored energy for months at a time and nobody knew how to de-energize those batteries. So once they're compromised, there's a lot of industry um, research on those to figure out how to make them safe once they have been damaged or compromised in the battery. So for firefighters, um, very similar to even solar energy storage systems, they've got to read up on it. They're approaching it from a safe angle because you do have the possibility of the thermal runaways as well as the explosions once they come in. So approaching it angles from different and keeping that battery, those items cool. Really, kind of the, the critical factor in battery um, EV type situations is keeping the battery compartment cool on it while you're operating on it, um, and then taking the time to sit down and learn about the car. And so, do they encounter electrical shocks? They could. Um, it, you know, I mean, that, that whole array of batteries to run a big car, it's got to produce a lot of juice. They do, but thankfully, you know, a lot of times they're more into the interior of the car where they're not as easily compromised as like the normal battery that's in an engine compartment, per se, where those batteries are back where you It's a constant learning curve because they are changing it all the time. So one quick, quick uh, question is that down the 17 freeway and the 303, Major, major building being built down there. Probably one of the largest buildings I've seen ever. And uh, from what I understand, it's a lithium battery production plant facility. Uh, the building on the right, on the way out there, is the Taiwanese semiconductor plant. Okay. Uh, so it'll be, it's, they're continuing to grow, but they will be having lithium ion batteries, but it's mostly semiconductors okay. um, throughout there. But they, with it being Taiwanese and green energy, they can have a lot of green energy initiatives, including lithium ion batteries. Um, and then a lot of the farms that we're going to start seeing for storage, because we have a lot of solar, but we don't have a lot of places to store the solar. Um, so the industry has changed significantly over the last couple of years, where they're not going to have big battery banks in big buildings. They're more in pods, so they can be constructed with explosive sensing and um, make safe devices that the state farmers are actually working very closely with the industry and NSPA and the laboratory. 
especially as buildings throughout Texas when I have these huge, huge miles of pods. And they're large. So my question for that would be is 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 the fire service here in the state of Arizona staying abreast of that construction and the hazards of once it's in operation or are we in communication with them? Are we preparing down the road for that type of industry? We are. And one of the coming from the entire purpose, we've been, I was able to be part of that TSM2, what we call the Highway Semi Conductor Plan. Um, the very front end of the fire service is brought in, uh, especially being built in Phoenix and then um, having the catastrophic event and surprise, and then there's been several others in Chandler. And so, being in Arizona, we're the, the fire marshal and code enforcement community, as well as operations, have been very in the pocket of the, the energy um, corporations, as well as performing to make sure that those codes are coming up. And one thing that, that we'll see as we go through the code adoption here in Sedona is we'll be going into 2018 fire code with amendments, as with, along with the state fire marshal's office. But what many people are doing is the 2021 and 2024 codes even are progressive in the code industry when it comes to battery and energy storage systems like that. So we'll be bringing in the future into the 2018 versus keeping it out of 2018 because that is constantly evolving. Because of the significant hazards, a lot of the buildings that we're going to see with charging stations uh, Sedona, we're going to be requiring them to be curbside, not interior, the parking garages, we can bury because of not only fire hazards to our firefighters, but you know, also to the office of the building and the amount of heat that can compromise the structure itself. So we're, we're going to stay in communication with the state in the west, southwest, really, and keep on talking. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chief Booth and Mr. Chair. Um, so, I'll report out on our operational support. Division Chief Mazoulis is on a much deserved vacation with his family. So, we're going to let Chief Mazoulis rest up for now because he's going to come back swinging hard. He always does. Um, and just kind of keep highlighting the training component. You can see that we had 4,300 hours this last period, which is a lot of training. But kind of tie in the, the discussion on vehicles, vehicle fires, you know, Chief Booth highlighted the, the battery concerns. Board Member Camella brought up a good, you know, our hybrid vehicles that are electric. Uh, the design now with those old series of batteries is that orange line, and it's high voltage. If you take your clippers like we used to back in the day to disconnect the power on, on, the, on the one battery, uh, it'll, it'll elect to the firefighter. So what does that mean? Well, it means we have additional training. And it, if the question is, is a vehicle fire hazardous to a firefighter? <laughs> Why? Yes. Definitely. We, we batteries, you know, lithium, high voltage. Thanks. Uh, McCarthy brought up uh, the aluminum, the magnesium, titanium. Some of the engine blocks on newer vehicles are uh, magnesium or titanium. You've got a vehicle fire that burns enough to catch that engine block on fire. Metal fires burn extremely hot. And uh, so as you put water on it, it literally will explode on you and throw big phosphorus balls at you. I've had that happen before. But we can overcome that with a lot of water for a small vehicle like that. So our firefighters receive a lot of training how to approach that vehicle. Uh, we come in at a 45 degree angle. The other thing that happens once they get going significantly is the tires explode. You know, if you're you're uh, buying a vehicle fire in a larger pickup or a truck, one of those tires goes, you don't want to be very close to it. It will throw debris and let alone a big construction truck with a big tire. So these are things that this is one thing we're talking about with the Sedona Fire District is a vehicle fire. What kind of hazards that is, what kind of training does that mean for our firefighters? That's why Training operation for is incredibly busy, you know, and then we did we aren't even highlighting the the hydrocarbons and the rubbers and the plastics in those vehicles. Those are all cancer causing agents. If you get a lot of exposure to it, which if you're a firefighter, you will.
will go on a vehicle park. So while we continue to maintain our training hours, this last month it said 4,300. Uh, the technical rescue team, again, two areas of expertise that we maintain uh, is swift water rescue, and we were able to get all of our teams uh, back up to that advanced level, the TRT team, and then also the refresher for the entire district to make sure we don't have an initial company that might not be the advanced level TRT team member get in trouble out there on Swift Water. Uh, the fire chief Swift Water is very concerning to me, especially if we have to put firefighter in the water. So it takes a lot of training, a lot of equipment, a lot of expertise so we don't get in trouble. Uh, and, uh, so the fact that we maintain that kind of advanced level training and trained our firefighters and caught everybody up, that's a good thing. Same thing with the rope rescue training. Obviously, with all the trail rescues we perform, uh, a hike out, that's one thing, but when we get up on rocks and cliffs and someone goes over the side, again, that takes a lot of expertise, but that's the level our firefighters are trained to. You can see uh, we had a, an excellent accomplishment there with firefighter Joe Pace in terms of uh, completing his instructor course for the uh, in advanced life support, critical care, and then the PALS, which is pediatric advanced life support, and also CPR. So that's just the normal training that our paramedic would obtain annually in the refreshers. He actually became an instructor. So again, that's valuable to us that we have in-house instructors in those areas, especially uh, under EMS where we're going to continue to need, and it's a big part of our mission. Going back up on the report, in terms of EMS activities and updates, again, we maintain a very high level of expertise to have every single one of our apparatus to be advanced life support, so a medic, paramedic on each one. It takes a lot of uh, continuing education and training, also maintaining our EMT certs for all other personnel. And one thing I want to say on the EMS that <clears throat> I want to highlight briefly is uh, recently we had a a response up at Slide Rock State Park uh, for a uh, anaphylactic reaction of a two-year-old girl. And um, to make a long story short, uh, this was a critical patient. She was in bad shape. But our engine got there and initiated care, and then our ambulance, our battalion, and uh, we were able to initiate some incredibly aggressive care. Uh, what wasn't apparent on the front side was why this child got into that kind of reaction, but uh, when we got her to Flagstaff Medical Center, uh, the physician, the treating physician there, it was interesting, was an expert in the environmental, you know, with fight team, uh, and she immediately recognized this was a scorpion fight. So there's specific anti-venom you want to give to that particular scorpion bite. So the doctor was super aggressive, trauma nurse super aggressive, but I received an almost three-minute phone call from the trauma nurse that the physician had conferred with the trauma nurse saying, hey, the fire district saved this little girl's life. I mean, they, as experts, said, no, you saved her life. So we were able to, you know, just applaud the crews that responded to that call, but why would I highlight that? Well, that was one of probably half a dozen critical calls we had in the last period that we actually save lives. And I'm not talking like a fire chief who gets in front of a community and says, we save lives. No, I'm giving you one specific example of a two-year-old girl who's only alive because of our firefighters and their training and the apparatus and equipment and all that specialties that we focus on, that we budget, that we continue to say, hey, we gotta get better at this. So uh, that's a big deal. You know, we have a remote district and sometimes our firefighters are out there with these patients alone for a bit, managing that. And we stay focused, we handle it. It won't be the last time that we save a two-year-old life. But we'll continue to do that, but boy, I'll tell you, it gives me pause, you know, to say, wow, our firefighters are doing a great job. And again, there's, when you have an outcome that positive because of intervention that you aggressively did, it's a big deal. So I wanted to camp a minute on that. And within this report, uh, in terms of fleet, we'll have a we have an agenda item just to redirect a different chassis. But uh, you know, of course, we have the two pumpers. 
under construction, even though it's a 22 month build, which is unheard of. But, you know, still with our fleet in terms of what we've ordered uh, and where we're headed, it's still challenging with the uh, supply chain. So that'll be a theme for a while, uh, but you'll see a creative way as we have an ask or, you know, inform you uh, how we how Chief Mazzullis and our staff have overcome that. So any questions for operational support? Not a question, just a comment and observation. Now, recently we've... Um, had some events in the VOC area um, that, um, <clears throat> if it gets out of hand, could be um, a bit of a problem. And that's base jumping. And they base jumped off of uh, Courthouse Butte. Um, now, there are legal base jumping areas down in the Mingus area and so on. There's, that, that's designed for that. But the internet is a, a wonderful tool to spread information and share the word. Um, Did you see the video of them doing it? Uh, I, it blew I, me away. Yeah. It's a, a ba you know, I'm, I'm all for daredevil sports. I used to do it. But uh, there's ways to do it, and then there's ways to do it. And unfortunately, the internet has can spread the word uh, and it can get out of control, putting our people and our pilots at jeopardy. So, FYI, maybe it's you know something to keep our eye out. It's that was in the county, Yelp by County, um, and uh, so anyways, food for thought. Well, that's an excellent point. And uh, when you have the uh, those extreme type of activities in undesignated areas. It will go sideways at some point, and there will be uh, a major injury or fatality or somebody trapped. And guess what? There's only one agency that's going to respond to that, even before the sheriff's, and that's the Zona Fire District. So thank goodness we have the apparatus equipment training. We have specialized people that are going to enact that rescue, although point of note is don't draw us into that if you don't have to. Go to the designated areas that are equipped for that and keep us safe, too. We're going to we're gonna act that rescue, and I know some years ago, I'm sure Chief Paul and Chief Mazuz could comment, that we had a, I believe it was a base jumper that fell, and Major Paul, and one of our firefighters went out there and did a 600-foot repel, and anyone was ever repelled, and to hunker down with that individual all night, treat them, and keep them warm, and until we could extricate them with the helicopter in the morning. So I put our firefighter in peril, who did a great job of saving lives, but we don't choose to be at peril. We have to in certain cases, but if, if that person won't draw us into that because they're doing something that wasn't, you know, that area's not designed for that, better. Good point. There's a lot of places to do a lot of things here. All right, well, we'll uh, some spectacular pictures there again. We'll finish the chief's report. Um, station four uh, construction, we finished up the contract with the feasibility study. Uh, their team should be on site here in July, starting to do some preliminary work on that. In parallel to that, our internal team, uh, we reviewed a lot of uh, requests for proposals, RFPs, or requests for qualifications, RFQ, trying to get a good model of where we're headed with that. We have a couple good templates that will uh, take one of those and convert it to customize for us here in our station and walk that down. And the hope is sometime parallel when that feasibility study <clears throat> is available to us, we'll also have a good template on our RFQ so we can push that out, and we will contract uh, someone to uh, come in, give us the architectural design, and manage and build our station. So uh, we're going to continue to move forward on that. The purchase orders, that large one was, again, for that network equipment. Uh, that we're, We've got some of that order arrived. <clears throat> we're waiting for the rest of that equipment, and then uh, our IT vendor and team will build out the architectural design of all that, get it installed so it's all working properly. And one of the things 
we're trying to emphasize on that too is that was just kind of replacing the old legacy equipment, that umbrella of network equipment with switches, routers, or transport path. Um, we do want to also put in that architectural design the redundancies that we need, like multiple switches and areas. So that will be something we design out and then probably do another significant order of equipment so we can eventually install that. But again, with supply chain issues, if I needed a particular switch right now, it's probably at least a year wait for me to get that switch. So uh, that's all in progress. That was a good step here for uh, rebuilding our system. And you can see the other one is the Arizona Emergency product. Uh, the upfit for our EMS vehicle um, that we're working on there, and that one was for twenty-four thousand. So, uh, and at the end of the packet, again, we put in a few correspondence, uh, and just really thankful uh, residents with some of our EMS response, and then also, yeah, Pine Flats property owners. You can see they made a donation. And that was relevant to our Fire West cleanup program that we've been doing for a number of years. And we're trying to expand that and increase the funding. And the group that uh, Board Member Soto went to, uh, or Chairman Soto went to, in an attempt to bring some of that type of Fire West deployment grant funding over onto the Verde Valley side, to develop a branch here. And I think those are really positive steps. Um, donations, you can see we had several. One was from uh, Diana Thomas, and much appreciated also uh, that one for the, the kindness fund for all of um, David's. And then you see the Pine, Pine Flats property. So we have very gen, uh, generous people here in the Sedona Fire District, and uh, we have a very generous community. And I think uh, when we highlight those donations, that's exactly what we're like. Very uh, gracious, and we put those funds to get use as needed. So, unless there's any further comment, oh, wait, not done. Sorry, keep moving. Thought I was towards the end, but uh, again, our public outreach and communication, and I think there's some very good questions uh, that Director Robinson handled earlier in terms of our website build out development. That, uh, we're, we're going to get out of the uh, archaic pages, I'll say, with our website <laughs> and make it modern and, and functional and usable. But it's just one step then as we collect that information and those links, and then we move towards a more significant marketing plan for the Sedona Fire District uh, that will cover a lot more components of what we're doing and how we're communicating and how we touch the community and how we elevate. <laughs> Really, that flow of information in a culture in an age where information is everywhere. So, what we're going to try to do is just funnel that information and make sure it's concise and clear and we get the right information for the community. We have some excellent uh, interaction there. And then uh, you can see on our public outreach and communication uh, the various postings that our duty chiefs continue to accomplish and do a great job. At and, uh, you know, I get a lot of positive comments from the community on these postings and how impactful they are. Neighbors walking by saying, hey, that was a great post. Thank you. I really appreciated that. I usually ask, well, give me specific information so I know what you're talking about. But uh, I, I get a lot of positive comments. I'm sure you do, too. So this, again, is uh, something we're continuing to engage in and try to improve. So I will complete the entire chief's report unless there are any questions or comments. Thank you, Chief, for your report. Okay. Um, next up on the agenda is the discussion, possible action, approval of amended uh, AC board action uh, communication technical rescue truck. Uh, Chief. Yes, sir. So uh, the initial back and the approval by the board was for uh, two vehicles. One was our uh, command unit, and the other was a technical rescue unit. So uh, as you saw from the documentation, the board recently reached out to us for the command unit project for the board, but the chassis for the technical rescue project 
a technical rescue unit, they um, had to redistribute who was going to get what chassis this year uh, because there was a shortage. And uh, they pushed our project to be at least a year you know, from now. So uh, Chief Mazzoulis and staff, uh, he did some research. And he was able to find that Dodd could provide a chassis for us uh, so we can finish that project. The box and where we'll store all the technical rescue equipment is actually was custom made and it's sitting in a shop that we'd like to tell that person that made it, here's the chassis so we can finish it and get it out of your shop. So rather than waiting for over a year for a chassis, uh, we, we have a similar uh, chassis with Dodge and we're going to get it to 90 to 120 days. It doesn't change the dollar amount. It doesn't change the approval of the two vehicles. Literally, we wanted to amend it to be transparent and clear to the board that, hey, we're going to have to go to a Dodge chassis. And since we specifically said Ford on those two units, well, one's going to be Dodge, and that's the, the, the uh, request on the approval just to uh, redo that so we can get that TRT unit done much quicker and back in, in its service. Is there going to be any uh, difficulty in adapting the box to the different chassis? No, there shouldn't be any difficulty. Chief Mazzoulis uh, walked that down to ground to confirm that the change won't really affect the, pro the product. It'll just be a Dodge instead of a Ford chassis. Does that change our um, secondary costs? Because I know it's been the point's been made that we're a Ford house. The consistency means it's easier for Mike to do the maintenance. Now we're going to have a Dodge chassis. Right, and that's a very good question because we like the, in terms of fleet, you know, like for example, we are pretty much buying Pierce pumpers now because there is some standardization with the pump, the transmission of the motor, um, and we try to do that with all our staff vehicles. So it is a change, although the nice thing is uh, it'll be under warranty for the specified period, which helps our shop because we can just take it to the Dodge dealer and then. Uh, there'll be a little bit of a, a adaption for our mechanic to get up to speed once we get past warranty. But uh, this is a vehicle that, to be quite frank, we should get about a 20-year use out of it. So I think it's plenty of time to get through the warranty period, make sure our mechanic can get up to speed. And uh, uh, it shouldn't be that big of an adjustment because it's just the one Dodge. So, Chief, primarily we're looking for a motion that, that just makes that change from that one Ford chassis to Dodge chassis on the technical rescue T TRT. Yeah, yeah, the TRT unit is that amendment that it'll be a Dodge chassis instead of Ford. I'll go ahead and uh, make a motion. I move to approve the purchase of a Dodge chassis to complete the technical rescue vehicle's build Total bill price not to exceed one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Do I have a second? Second. Further discussion? In favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thanks, sir. Okay. Okay. Last item on the agenda is um, discussion. Board members fire district related activities since the last board meeting. So. As the norm, I usually let the ladies go first. Uh, <laughs> gee, thank you. There you go. Helen, if you would. Um, so basically, it's been the usual in terms of, uh, I did forget last month to mention I had a very useful one-on-one -on -one with the chief. Um, but this month, it's been mostly paying bills, signing bills, and uh, finishing up getting my, uh, as of today, I've officially put my uh, paperwork in for the election. So. Well, congratulations. You took it to the county? Took it to the county, and it's all done. And have you? I take mine on the 28th. <coughs> We're taking Scott's on the 11th. Right. You're good. Thank you. Gene? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, had a, I, I had a good meeting with the chief yesterday. Mm -hmm. Have you? And I enjoy, I enjoy those times. And... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Scott, he's sitting in the audience, and I um, sat at a table at Clark's Market. 
And um, while we were gathering signatures on petitions, we had an opportunity to talk to people and hear and listen to them. And good questions, because again, the vast majority of people, what's a fire board? What do they do? And so we had an opportunity uh, to share that information with them. And uh, along with that, um, a lot of good comments about what you guys do, what your men and women do for this department, for them. I know that. Uh, it's good, just good to know that they know that, feel that way. So um, we gathered some signatures. I met people there coming in and out of the store and market that I, I, I know I've known them for 30 years or more, involved in different parts of my past careers. And so you just never know who you're going to run into. That's simple. All right, Scott? That's it. But I got it. Okay. Yeah, for taking me down. All right. Well, thank you. Well, well I, I've, I've, I've had fun coming in and signing big checks. That's, I've never thought my signature had value, but that's, that's, <laughs> that is fun. Uh, but also, uh, I've done some posting, uh, one of uh, picking up on what the fire crews up at the uh, airport and the and uh, Good connecting to the, uh, the the fire information uh, websites and data and I get lots of compliments back that it, it, in one place, place I gave them visuals of what's going on and links to uh, how to get the information about those fires, the status, up to date too, I mean it takes like real time. And, uh, and and I pleased it, and I didn't even ask anybody at the airport for permission. I just took those shots and did it, and then <laughs> the airport manager uh, gives me a thumbs up. So, so they were pleased that we demonstrated that the airport really has turned into like a military base. Uh, they took over half the field, almost 100 people, you know, all staying in hotels here, and it was – it's 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 a lot to share to people that uh, uh, everybody's working together. And then I had the opportunity to drop in at the Sedona Fire District. Uh, it's a wildland deployment is taking place in New Mexico and right here in um, in Arizona up by Flagstaff. So um, it was a good post. I got a lot of compliments on it. I, I was pleased that I it was actually helpful. It was more than just a picture. All right. Thanks, Edward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, this past month, I had an opportunity to uh, work with an or organization over in Prescott, and this had to do with Firewise. October of last year, my subdivision, the Homeowners Association, asked of me if I would look into any kind of programs that are out there to reduce fuel load. Uh, in and around our homes as it pertained uh, to wildland fires and things of that sort. I said, sure, I'll look into it. And one thing led to another, and the term FireWise came up. And FireWise is a NFPA, a National Fire Protection Association endorsed program. And uh, I started looking into it and saw the, the, the recommendations and criteria and, and things that they sponsor and the information that they send out to homeowners or jurisdictions uh, free. And as I gathered information, I got a hold of different names of people who are involved with it, and in particular the Coffee Pot Homeowners Association that I went to one of their meetings to gain information, and lo and behold, after that meeting, I had become an authorized home assessor <laughs> just <laughs> by virtue of attending and, and going through the exercises on what to look for around our homes. So I've yet to report back to my homeowners association because as of recently, on June 2nd, I attended a meeting of the Prescott Area Wildland Inter Urban Interface Committee. And basically, they are focused around FireWise for the entire Prescott, Prescott Valley and Chino area and are recognized by the Yavapai County Board of Supervisors enabling them to 
have some authority to do things and to establish funding for their program and aimed towards homeowners to get them started. Uh, what they're looking for is expanding and towards the Verde Valley area, which would be this side of the Mingus Hill. And in talking to uh, Chief Booth, I have similar interest in that program. So in attending, I was able to see that there is a full board. There are vacancies on the board, and they're always looking for help. Uh, but there also was the Forest Service Rangers. They were there um, stating their participation in the program. And it's a program that is, is well versed, well exercised, and they're all have the same common thread of skills, protecting, preserving, and all those sort of things. So with that said, uh, I, I went to, to the chief and because I recognize that this is bigger than just one person in a subdivision, and it needs to be at that level where a fire district and or a city champion this kind of a cause, make it more of a uh, spread. So we're making our strides to move in that direction, and eventually I'll report back to my homeowners association president and let them know where we're at and what we, we think we ought to do, but we very well could be a second or third uh, subdivision in Sedona that is recognized uh, as a firewise community. So uh, pretty impressive. It's a big program. Uh, like everything else, funding is um, out there, but you got to go after it and through the grant process. So um, a lot of education on that one, so I was glad to uh, be part of it. And I explained to my wife, I don't know where this is going, but it is a, a worthy program to get involved with. So it happens down the road. That was my involvement. So and I don't know if Chief Booth, if you had any comments uh, towards the program or anything? No, you know, I thank you for going. I, I wanted to go with you, but I ended up at a wildfire myself. So, um, no, it, it is a great program. I got introduced to a lot of their key leaders at the Wildfire Academy back in February and been able to sit on their monthly meetings and just the impressive participation from all the communities in the Prescott area. Um, you know, it's, it's awesome. I mean, one of the conversations that we had was trying to get on this side of the hill, kind of the the neglected side of Yavapai yeah, County because we're, we're on the yeah. wrong side of the mountain. But I think together, especially as you have seen, I think we can grow that in working with the Brady Valley Fire Marshals and PAL. I really think that we're going to be able to join join both sides of the mountain and be a collective unit. Right. I will say that those communities uh, under this committee are well involved. They are very involved and committed to making changes around their properties for the better to buy time. Basically, that's what you're doing, buying time and saving your property. Okay. With that said, unless there are any other comments, our June meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. So this is the back of the... Yeah.